Welcome to the film cast review of Christopher Nolan's Oppenheimer. According to the plot summary from IMDb, Oppenheimer tells the story of American scientist J. Robert Oppenheimer and his role in the development of the atomic bomb. Joining us today for this review, he is a filmmaker and video essayist. You can reach, you can watch his work, I should say, at youtube.com slash Patrick H. Willems. Patrick Willems, welcome back to the film cast. Hello, guys. It's good to be back. It's great Hello. to have you, Patrick. Hello. So much to dive into here today. Uh, before we begin talking about anything about the movie, uh, I want to acknowledge that this movie is based off of real life events. Uh, so, but at, that being said, we still think that some details about how uh, the movie executes certain things are considered mm -hmm. spoilers. So we're going to try to be light on details during the first part of this review. We'll have a separate spoiler section where we'll talk about the movie in full detail. Um, but there will be a spoiler section, and yes, I realize that is a little bit absurd, but hey, you know, uh, we this try is to the world we the live listen. in. This is the world yeah. we live in. We, yeah, yeah so. we're all the product of public education. We probably don't know half the stuff that happens in this movie. <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I didn't know this guy made a bomb in the first place. No, anyway, so. Um, Up in Hoomer? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so before we even start talking about the movie, I think it's worth talking a little bit about our experience watching the movie because this movie is in almost as many formats as avatar basically right like sure. it's there's many different ways you can watch this movie patrick h will it oh, relies sorry. on a palm pilot for a lot of uh, <laughs> it's, it's it success does. you That's know right yep um so patrick h williams let's start with you uh how did How I see did it? You, and apparently, my understanding is you've watched the movie twice at this I've, point. I've right? seen it twice. Wow. Okay. So, what what circumstances? What movie theater? Yeah. You know, how was your? I, I will put this bet out there. By the way, Patrick saw it in the best way possible. Yeah, Among that, all, I of agree. Us, Patrick, I, wins. I agree yes. that Patrick probably had the best experience. Yes. Patrick hit us. I had uh, <laughs> so, saw it twice, same screen both times. No bad experience, but the, mm -hmm. but the experiences were different. He just wouldn't leave. <laughs> that was it. Yeah, I, 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 leave hit, that I hid I under the seats to be like, I'm, I'm going to catch the next one. Um, so I saw it at the AMC Lincoln Square on the Upper West Side of New York City. You know, God bless it. Yeah. Uh, that giant, giant IMAX screen. That it is a full. It is a full. It is one of the few full mm -hmm. IMAX screens in the country. Full size IMAX, like. What is it? Uh, one by nine aspect ratio, or, or one by point nine aspect ratio, or something like that. Like, yeah, it's it, like it, it's either the first or second, I think, largest screen in the country, something like wow. that. Anyway, I it's, that. one point yeah. four three by one. I apologize. There we go. 1. 4, 3 uh, by one, yeah. It's very big, and it's like if you live in New York, you know that that is like if there's an IMAX movie, if there's an Avatar, if there's a Nolan movie, it's like you get ready to buy those tickets for opening day the second they go on sale because for that screen. Most showings are like mostly sold out through like August sixth right now. And oh, also, wow. there's probably like fourteen seats in the whole theater that are worth <laughs> sitting in. Right? It's true. Half the theater it is, is like not. You don't want to sit there. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. But so I went on Tuesday uh, to a press screening. I was not invited. I was a plus one of someone who was. Wow, invited. nice. Uh, and they played it on seventy millimeter IMAX. Uh, you could see, you know, little bits of like, little particles and bits of hair that were like in the projector and uh, it felt very <laughs> tactile and it was wonderful. Played flawlessly, incredible experience. I saw it last night, again, same screen. And, uh, and I noticed early on in the movie, I'm like, this looks a little bit different. Mm -hmm. the, uh, the 70 millimeter non IMAX black and white stuff doesn't look quite as like crunchy and contrasty. I'm not seeing the particles and it occurs to me, oh, they're playing it on a DCP. Despite the fact that we bought tickets for what was listed as 70 millimeter, uh, 70 millimeter IMAX, it's not actually playing on film. And Aww. so I'm guessing there was some kind of technical issue, something like that, because, you know, it, this was actual opening day. This was not the first showing of the day. Yeah. I don't know what was. I mean, it still looked and sounded incredible, ran, you know, flawlessly. It just was not on film. Did you know, like, and, the theater? It did expand to fill the whole IMAX oh, screen. Oh, yeah. Just, right. it, it, yeah, again, like, stuff, ab yeah, yeah. Absolute full IMAX, just 
mm-hmm. not playing on the like tactile film. And having seen them both, like you, you can notice the that the, just the difference in the experience. Fasc- fascinating. I, I so, do wonder, Patrick, did you talk to the theater about this? Like that is a <laughs> no. call the theater manager situation. <laughs> well, well no, maybe sir. they'll hear this. Uh, yeah. no, it was just a thing like afterwards because I was with a couple people who had also been there on Tuesday, mm. and we were all like. That that was different, right? That wasn't interesting. Just me. <laughs> so I saw this movie at uh, downtown Seattle uh, AMC, and it was projected on film. I don't know if it was seventy millimeter, probably it was, pro- but it was projected mm-hmm. on film. And I will tell you that we had some technical challenges with the movie. First of all, uh, there was like a very v- it, the movie started ten minutes late, which is a lot for a three hour movie. There was a very uh, visible flicker in on the screen at all times, which I don't know if it's supposed to look like that. Like it's very Film like, used to flicker. It used to, I, yeah, I it's remember like, it's like, when did, I went did to it the used theater. To flicker this much. I don't remember. Yeah. And then at one point in the movie, I would say about an hour to an hour and a half into the movie, the movie completely stopped. Like it just ground, just complete black, <laughs> no sound, nothing. Uh, and People started like like a ton of people fled to go to the bathroom at that point. They're like, <laughs> perfect. Well, if it's, actually, yeah. if it's yeah. actually on film, there's no way for sound to play without picture. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it ground to a halt, and then uh, it took them like about two minutes. And I could I looked back up and I could see someone like was rapidly trying to like troubleshoot <laughs> something, and then eventually like sort of slowly started back to life. And then the rest of the movie was without incident. Mm-hmm. I will also say that this AMC that I was in was not equipped to handle 450 people at once in a theater for three hours because it was sweltering in there. It was like by the end where me and my people, the friends who I brought are like buck, pouring buckets of sweat. Wow. It's like, that's the uh, true Los Alamos, <laughs> yeah. New Mexico You're experience. In the 40X screen. Right. I was in the that's 40X screening. I was in the 40X yeah. Yeah. So, and no, anyway, no actually like the dictator. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, he, yeah he, that was his, yeah. He, he specified the that's temperature. That's the way it's meant to be seen. <laughs> So, uh, so kind of like, it just made me think like, oh, wow. Yeah. It's been years since projectionists have been working at these theaters at all. Mm -hmm. They probably had to call all the projectionists out of hiding to try to even do this. Um, (laughs) Devinder Hardwar, you had also a unique experience watching. The red phone rings in a room. (laughs) A man picks it up. Oh, there you are gotta stories. come out of retirement. <laughs> you yeah. have a set of particular skills. <laughs> no, you're joking, Jeff, but that is absolutely true. I saw some stories. Um, somebody had tweeted this, but I think uh, in Canada, when theaters needed IMAX uh, projectionists, they had to call LA to ship somebody <laughs> over to work that theater. So, <laughs> yeah, we're, that's, yeah, it's a thing. I have you had a those unique... skills, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah. I was trained as a projectionist in my Jeff, youth. Were you trained for the giant ass seventy millimeter IMAX scan? Hell no, yeah. of course Look not. Look how but big those are. Yeah. Can't be that different. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 I mean, you could tell it was filmed, by the way, because yeah. um, of the cigarette burns. I used to be a yep. projectionist in college as well, and you know, there's a mark that shows on the top right corner of the screen when you need to change reels. And you could tell that's why it was projected. Mm-hmm. That's how it's projected on film. Um, Devinder Hardwar, uh, you had a unique experience watching Oppenheimer as well, right? I will, I will also bet that I probably had the abjectly worst Oppenheimer <laughs> experience because uh, listen over here, we have one good IMAX and that's at the mall of Georgia and that's booked also for weeks. So maybe I can get like a daytime showing in the next few weeks, but I had to see it last night, uh, both for work for Engadget and to review it here. Um, so I booked an RPX ticket at Regal, which I'm totally fine with. It's a big ass screen. It has you know good sound. The the seats rumble. The seats like hit you in the back during big explosions. So that's fun. Um, I'm driving to the theater. There's a big rainstorm. Like while we're having dinner, I'm like oh that's not good. Um, driving to the theater, and there's a point where you realize like things are bad. Like oh this stoplight is now just a flashing red light. That's not good. I'm <laughs> driving forward. <laughs> entire like an entire strip mall entire malls completely dead black just black <laughs> i was sitting at like an intersection with no working lights and people were just like graciously like going across um but i sat there in the parking lot of the regal no lights no nothing i'm like this is a problem <laughs> so i immediately uh took that picture uh which i tweeted um or no it's on other services i booked another ticket and i just like you remember that car chase and tenant guys where you're going backwards through the road <laughs> that you just drove down. I was like, okay, I have uh, the movie started five minutes ago, or at least that's the list of time. So zoom, tenant, tenant race down the road. I missed the first couple minutes of the movie, but uh, I did make it to a lesser theater 
It's called NCG. You've never heard of it. Um, it doesn't have good screens. The sound is fine. Um, but I sat front row, so I made my own like makeshift uh, IMAX experience. Oh my that was god! Fun. Oh my god! And like, like really shitty. Wait, really did you shitty sit front row seats. by choice, or was oh, yeah. it? That's okay, the this is one of those theaters. You know it's a uh, it's front row because there's like twenty feet between the ah, front right. row and the screens. I'm like, yes, fine. Nobody's in front of me. The seats are awful. Uh, but that's how I saw Oppenheimer, and it was fine. Wow. Was that great. Kanata, your experience watching Oppenheimer? I can't compare to any of that. Um, <laughs> I, I went to a press screening. It was the farthest I've had to drive for a press screening. It was a full hour away in a in a lightning storm uh, that we've been having here in Denver. But Man. Um, that's, you know, a small price to pay. I It was projected in 70 millimeter, um, not IMAX, but it was uh, it was projected on film in 70 millimeter. Um, and it looked, uh, it looked very, very nice, but yeah, no, I, I, it was no, <laughs> there were no, uh, no events to, that were worth mentioning as uh, the movie yeah. started and then it you, ended. You, you drove an hour, Jeff. That's pretty eventful for a screening. Yeah. That's, for Denver, that's a lot. Yeah. For LA, that would be like, oh, you, you must have gone to one of the closest that's theaters Tuesday. to your house. <laughs> yeah. For you, that's Tuesday. Yeah. 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 Indeed. Indeed. All right. Well, anyway, I, I thought it worth it to share that because, uh, people probably will be wondering where we're coming from. I will this tell you that this is a big experience. Yeah, like it's I, important how you see it too. Exactly. So, yeah. I will tell you that I separately purchased tickets for a true IMAX screening uh, next Wednesday. Um, many of which are sold out at the Pacific Science Center in Seattle. Yeah. Uh, but I said, hey, what is the what is the screening that has the least number of tickets sold? And they said Wednesday 1 p.m. And so I said, okay, that's what I'm going to go see uh Oppenheimer again all that being said that's how we saw the movie let's talk about the movie itself Patrick Willems we'll start with you obviously you've spent a lot of time studying Christopher Nolan and his work uh I would argue this is somewhat different than a lot of the other stuff that he's made uh Mm -hmm. I am curious what did you think overall of Oppenheimer yeah I, I I mean as far as uh in relation to Nolan's work, I I had a feeling after Tenet, I was like, this feels like the culmination or like like kind of like the logical end point of a lot mm-hmm. of stuff he's been into and doing for many years. I'm like, I think whatever comes next, he's going to pivot in some way because, yeah. you know, he can't the, the, like there's only so much more he can do with like big spectacle and time stuff. And uh, and so I I wasn't surprised that he decided to do something like this. And of course, this is a movie about men talking in small rooms and it's still Great like men like genius the, men of course yes. i i love that but like on paper this movie is a pretty small scale movie uh and, and it's and it's still like done in like the, the the largest feeling way possible it's like you've got to see these close-ups of people like <laughs> you know delivering depositions in, in a five-story tall screen but i uh, after my first viewing i was like i think this is great and after my second viewing, I'm like, this might be my favorite movie of the year. Wow. Uh, yeah. Right. It's uh, the the thing, the like, uh, on, on second viewing, the things that I was like, not totally sure were working for me, basically all clicked together a lot better. And um, it is, I mean, I, I've, I've been trying to think like, okay, how do I what can I say about this that like that that's not just repeating things that that are in like a million reviews and stuff like that, but it is just like uh, in terms of the actual experience of it, I think it is pretty just just like pretty overwhelming from just the scale of it, from the pace of it, just the the concussive nature of the sound. Uh, and it's just uh, you know, it's not often you walk away from a big summer blockbuster movie just kind sort of emotionally shattered and like really, you know, as you watch a, a man reflect on, did he straight up destroy and irreparably ruin our world? <laughs> and, uh, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. it's, um, yeah, I, I think it's, it's, it's pretty great. A uh, big thumbs up from me. All right. That's Patrick H. Williams thoughts on Oppenheimer. Divin your hardware, your overall thoughts on this movie. Sure. Uh, my overall thoughts are, uh, I, I think this movie is fascinating. I think it also fits very much within the Nolan wheelhouse, uh, although in like a complicated way. But I will say up front, this is not my favorite movie of the year. And honestly, I am I am tempted to go see it in full IMAX because it's rare to get a movie that is fully built for IMAX and everything and takes advantage of it. But also I'm like, 
I don't know if I want to see this again that soon because I think it is a really fascinating movie. It you know wrestles with some really uh, tremendous moral questions. And Oppenheimer, uh, Oppie, as we'll call him, um, is Must is we? a is a fascinating figure through history. Like whenever I've read about him or seen stories about him, like the the idea that you know this genius level guy was able to command this team, which requires a certain amount of charisma, and like you know we're we're gonna see some like uh, you know startup bros uh, growth hacking. You know how how to run a team like Oppenheimer? Oh, how to how to create yeah. like a nuclear <laughs> yeah Manhattan Project level startup? Um, <laughs> there's a lot of work that goes on here, and I think this movie shows a lot of that. And also shows like his level of genius and his sort of like worldliness too. Like he is a very progressive guy. He is trying to do all sorts of. He has his fingers in many pies, and he's thinking deeply about the world. There's almost something monk like about him too like and uh, i think this is true both in reality and the way killian murphy plays him not the whole sexy time thing like this guy loves to loves to get sexy uh <laughs> as we will talk about but the way he is sort of like devoted to to the science and the way he is so he's just like bone thin he's there's like nothing driving him except the work and the science and i think that's fascinating too um and yeah the, the the power of his work you know uh I, I think this movie does wrestle with the idea of like well we are we are geniuses we can make this thing this thing may stop the war but it's is it our responsibility how it gets used i would say yes i would say maybe they should think more deeply about that and this movie does try to wrestle with some of that but i also feel like it's incredibly disjointed um I, I didn't have trouble keeping track of what's going on, but I think the way it was put together felt really disorienting. It does a Nolan thing, which I remember people complaining about during the dark night where it's like the editing is just like, Oh, you're in a completely different space. Like he is not waiting for establishing shots. Like you're going from room to room to room, different places. Uh, two people meet each other and 30, you know, 10 seconds later, they're naked together in a bedroom. Like things progress so quickly. I think the human relationships don't really hit. Uh, I think the women are completely underserved in this movie. Like it is a fucking travesty what this movie does to both of the prominent female characters. Um, I was, I was reminded of, we talk about this a lot when we talk about uh, biopics once again, um, was it uh, Dewey Cox? Yeah. Walk hard. Talk about walk hard. And I'm reminded of Kristen Wiig and walk hard <laughs> juggling three babies yelling at Dewey Cox. Oh, you can't do this. Dewey Cox. <laughs> You can't comp accomplish this dream. <laughs> Literally, that scene, except that this time the wife is supporting him. It's like, yes, I. This is all angry. I'm a drunk. I, you know, this is so hard. But you must accomplish your dream. I'm here to serve you for that dream. I think that's all super disappointing. I think Nolan, of all people, should be aware of what people think of like how he treats women in his movies. Like that, it just happens so often. So I thought that was that really took me out of it. Because it really does just go for all the like tortured wife uh, stereotypes, I think. Like, I, I love Emily Blunt, but I think she was vastly underserved by this movie. And yeah, I, it's great. There are some great conversations. I was reminded of JFK a lot too, in terms of like the talkiness and how it tries to like make very, very dry things or just like conversations, very cinematic. I think it does that really well. I'm just left like, man. I, I'm so disappointed by some aspects of this movie while being wowed by some others. And we'll talk about the big the big set piece that is in it. I think that's beautifully done. But this is a messy movie. And, you know, it, it's just a shame. Wow. Preach, Devinger. I feel like I agree with yeah. pretty much every single thing you said just now. But that being said, Jeff Kanata, so curious what you think about this movie. Well, Dave, <laughs> I guess you could say what I think about this movie is best summed up in the form of a limerick. All right, let's hear it, Jeff. A frog in a tree is a hoppin' climber. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Rap at a stoplight, you're a stoppin' rhymer. <laughs> That's not what it's about, but if Barbie's sold out, you might as well go to see Oppenheimer. <laughs> that's bravo. not my real limerick. That's just a the, different the limerick. Oppenheimer limerick bravo, right bravo, there. Jeffrey. Yeah. Bravo. That's this yeah. is your Oppenheimer, so to speak. <laughs> you know, that was your Christopher Nolan's Oppenheimer. It that's did feel like my, three uh, hours. Yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm supposed to say rap at a red light, not a stoplight, because mm, then yeah. it messes it up. But then whatever. you need to stop that. Um, yeah. That's not my real uh, <laughs> limerick. I did it. Uh, that was just a fun one I did. Uh, here's my real limerick. <laughs> wow. He's just tossing off masterpieces left and right. Like, we, we get like two in one episode? Yeah. 
Uh, it was like when when Spielberg made Munich and that other movie in one year, right? Like, <laughs> <laughs> what, did he, what was the other film he War made? War of the Worlds. War of, yeah. the, he, yeah. he, War of the Worlds and Munich in one year. That was he's just like uh, Jeff. I can make two. You know? <laughs> just no just toss one off. All right, here we go. Ready? Uh, like Nolan, it's focused and calm, but for me, that's not really a qualm. The script's analytical. It's focused political. It's the acting that's really the bomb. Mm. All right. Wow. Nice. Wow. Nice. 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 That- very, Very solid. Very solid, Jeff. Thank you. Um, I I don't disagree with a lot of what uh, Devendra said. I also really enjoyed the experience of seeing this, and I and I you know I don't disagree with Patrick on a on a certain level. I don't know if it's going to be my favorite movie of the year. It is. I think it is a very compelling, interesting movie for three hours. It manages to keep me completely engaged in what is. Mm-hmm. ostensibly like you said Patrick dudes in a room talking right uh and that's not an easy thing to pull off i i have to admit at being a bit disappointed with how much it is really a biopic and mm-hmm. davinci spoke mm-hmm. to this beautifully it is full on a biopic right yep. and you in, in the to- negative associations of that mm-hmm. term right is well in a describing? sort of template yeah, banal kind of like I've seen this a million times. Biopicy, biopic. Yep. Yeah, 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 and it is a testament to how great artists going to do something that is very uh, staid and uh, run of the mill and expected can elevate that work. Right? It, you can you can have something that is mediocre. Uh, mediocre is the wrong word. It is sort of expected and unsurprising and apply great artists to it and have something that you go, wow, this is extremely well executed. The, the way it's shot, the, the majesty of what you're seeing. And, and again, I will say the acting across the board, but particularly Gillian Murphy, who deserves an Academy Award nomination at the least for this. Uh, he is, I've never seen him work at this level. It, 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 this is an extraordinary performance. He is in 99% of the frames of this movie, has to carry it completely and does it with such an amazing sort of groundedness and steadiness that is always watchable. He is always watchable. There is something so confident about his performance and confident about that man, right? He is... It is an extraordinary performance. I can't say enough about his work in particular. Um, and you see, like, when you leverage that kind of talent and artistry to what is a, a very sort of mundane, run-of-the-mill kind of experience, it does elevate it. And I walked out of there going, this was extraordinary. It was an extraordinary experience to step through history in this way. And there's a lot of other great performances. Emily Blunt is great. Robert Downey Jr. is great. There's a lot of great performances throughout. Even s- small parts are, are well, well executed. But it is still disappointing to me, I think, that this, this filmmaker would sort of approach this material w- in this way, that it just feels mm-hmm. so, it feels so formulaic and, uh, and, and, and it doesn't take big risks, really. It, it, and it, you know, and it, I'm curious what you guys think, and maybe this is a conversation deeper to have in spoilers, but I do feel like the goal of this movie is to redeem this man in a certain way. Hmm. And I don't know if I'm on board for that, you know? Like, it is a disturbing notion, uh, 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 what we are witnessing in this movie. And the movie never, the movie, I think, takes the position consistently that, hey, you're misjudging this guy. If you th- Sci- you know, the application of science is good no matter what we're doing. It's like, well, <laughs> no. I don't know if that's true. And, you know, I, I feel like, I feel like this is, overall, I feel very positive about, about the movie. I think it is an amazing step through history. I think it gets sidetracked. I am reminded, like uh, Devendra said, I'm very much reminded of JFK. Mm-hmm. Although that movie takes way bigger swings, right? It is that it's movie has a bonkers. point of view. It's insane. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. yeah nothing I mean, about it's, it's real. crazy yeah. on a certain level, but also yeah. like it has a point of view. Yeah. And and, mm-hmm. and I don't know that this one necessarily comes out 
in favor of anything other than like this guy was kind of, you know, treated poorly by people. The title um, should be I Am Become Death? Question mark? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The other, the other movie that I was reminded yeah. of is like, it, this feels more like the Steve Jobs movie mm. than I know. Mm. any previous Nolan movie, right? It is. I, yeah. I, I would disagree with that one, Jeff, but go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, well, finish, the, finish what you're saying. Yeah. In yeah. framing device, in sort of yeah. like, you know, we're in this one moment of time. Sure. It's sure. interesting what, how Nolan expresses time. And as you'd say, I, I never felt disjointed by it. I thought it was interesting that he sort of flips the visual style and does black and white for what is the present day in the movie and color for what are flashbacks mm -hmm. in the movie's language. I thought that was fascinating. Um, I'd never seen anybody do that before. But ultimately, like, I don't think it actually delves into the most interesting stuff of this story in any yep. real way. Yep. And, I, and, and it is compelling what we see on screen, but I think the movie serves best as a, a bridge into doing more investigation into what actually the, the history of this moment it, 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 is, it is not a standalone piece in that regard for me. Like it is only a, uh, uh, an access point to learning more rather than sort of being a comprehensive yeah. um, look at all sides of that issue. It, it, it just, it's, it's a very interesting movie. And honestly, I like it a lot more than some of the most recent, <laughs> I, uh, I like it more than Dunkirk, for example, more mm. than most recent I recall, Nolan stuff. Yeah. But um but overall, it's so conventional in its form that I found I came away a bit disappointed in Nolan just because I expect more of him. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, f I feel like there's I, I, that. Yeah. yeah, I agree with a lot of what you said, Jeff. You know, it is really sad and tragic to watch a story of this guy who uh, created something that like grew beyond his control, ended up changing his whole industry and the world. Um, but enough about Chris Nolan in the Dark Knight. Like, <laughs> I want to talk about my feelings on Oppenheimer. And uh, I, I agree with a lot of what you guys have said. I, I, I'm more in line with Devendra a little bit. And, and Jeff, I want to address some of your points in the spoilers. Mm -hmm. I think it'll be a good conversation. I think the stuff that's about the building of the bomb is super interesting. Like, I, I, it's just like, wow, like all these questions the scientists had to confront. You know, the logistical to, to, stuff, the yeah. logistical stuff. Like we need to build a place in the middle of nowhere and we need to ship people here from there. And it's like, basically these scientists helped to create the world that we live in today. When we think of things like mutual or destruction, when we think of what does an atomic bomb look like, they, they're the ones that help to, to answer those questions in the first place. And it's fascinating to like the, the movie puts you in that perspective of like, wondering hey should we proceed if there's a non-zero chance igniting this thing is going to destroy the planet like should mm -hmm. we like is it a z close to zero enough chance that we should do it you know it puts you in that perspective it is a very subjective movie um in, in the sense that it puts you in the perspective of actually oppenheimer like you see his dreams and visions and hallucinations and in that regard, I think it makes full use of the cinematic experience like what Christopher Nolan is, is really well known for. It is an experience, you know, and, and I think it should be watched on a big screen and, and Christopher Nolan demands it. And that's why I really admire this movie. I admire Christopher Nolan. I think you should still go see the movie. But yeah, I think uh, I agree with a lot of what Jeff said. I, I wouldn't use the word formulaic because there are some ways that Christopher Nolan structures this movie Mm -hmm. that are different than a conventional biopic, I would argue, right? Like, he uses time in different ways. The the flashback and the flash forward, that stuff, and and the way those things are cut together, I do think is something that Nolan brings to the mix. But I think in terms of pacing, the movie is pretty rough. Uh, I, I, it just... All the bomb stuff, basically, was great, like, in terms of how interesting it was and how thrilling it was and how the questions it raises... And the other stuff that we can talk about in spoilers, I wasn't as much of a fan of mm -hmm. uh, and, and really blunted the impact of the film for me. So those are some of my overall thoughts. Speaking, Any other th yeah, go ahead. Speaking yeah, specifically to the, um, to the IMAX of it all, uh, I have not seen the movie in full IMAX. And I'm curious, Patrick, for you to speak more about that before we get to spoilers. But um, 
it is interesting that even as far back as you know the dark knight there are no one seems to select the scenes that are shot in the full format to create a certain impact right to create a to heighten them these big bombastic set piece moments and it's i found it so interesting that this movie I don't, I would never even use the word set piece. Like there's the bomb moment is a big moment, but there's nothing in this movie to me that demands seeing it in IMAX. I think it's cool that the movie is shot on film and 70 millimeter, all that stuff. It's cool. It's seeing it on a big screen, but seeing any movie on a big screen is, and it, it's a beautifully shot movie. Yeah. But, I, I, but th there's nothing, there's no moment in this movie that mm -hmm. I felt, boy, I wish I was seeing this on a true IMAX screen. And I'm curious, Patrick, yeah. if I'm wrong there, having actually had that experience. Yeah, I, I mean, it is such an unconventional use of IMAX because generally what we're used to is IMAX is used for spectacle. It's like, see the the giant mm -hmm. action scenes and stuff like that. And the, like, the, the IMAX shots that I think back on, like, most vividly that made, like, the most impression on me are, like, close-ups of Killian Murphy. Yeah. Mm. And uh and just like staring at his like haunted eyes that that are like each eyeball is like the size of a person like <laughs> yeah. in real life. Yeah. It is just it's something that I've never seen done before because, you know, movies like this are never given this kind of treatment. And so it is like and I don't think it's quite as simple as the you know kind of the classic thing of like oh immersion uh because it's like oh you're you know it's the sort of thing like um if uh did we all see the dark knight in imax i did when yes. that first yeah. came out yes. so remember when that first shot comes on and we all feel like we're, we're like falling into the screen because yeah. we've never seen anything mm -hmm. like this before so it's it's not quite that because they do use the IMAX, like they'd have those aerial shots like that for establishing shots, but watching these scenes of just like, like the, the detail and depth on these close-ups and just like forcing like you to just like look so deeply at a person, it like zoomed in further than you've ever seen anything before. Uh, it's, I, I'm having a tough time putting into words like what effect it has mm -hmm. because I mean, this is, a, I think so much of this movie is about just like reading what is in Killian Murphy's eyes and like what is on like Oppenheimer's face because he's not a guy who's like, you know, talking to everybody about how he feels all the time. This is a right. guy, like, I, th I, you know, I don't want to derail things too much, but um, <laughs> I, uh, one thing I, I do want to address, uh, because, uh, Devinder, you brought up the whole like formulaic biopic thing and the walk hard comparison. The walk hard stuff specifically. And yeah. I have seen this movie twice. I have made a whole very long video about biopics where I talked extensively about walk yep. hard. I yep. didn't think about walk hard once during this. I think mm. it's when the baby started happening, <laughs> when Emily Blunt is shouting, it's like, I was like, I haven't even thought about walk hard that much in like a decade. And I flashed right back to I that. I got scene. some walk hard. Yeah. I got yeah. some walk hard vibes for sure. I, I mean, it's yeah. like, I, I understand exactly why you made the comparison. And I, I'm not, I, 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 I don't even think you're wrong. I just, I didn't have that experience yeah, at all. Yeah, I didn't yeah. think about conventional biopics. And I think the thing is for me is that like, when I think of the kind of biopics that Walk Hard is parodying, those are like the, you know, like birth to earth one. It's like mm -hmm. start at, as they're a kid, just hit the checklist of everything. And uh, until they're an old man. And, uh, and this, like, while this does like, there's aspects of the storytelling here where I, I see how you can make the comparison. This feels like so centered, like singularly on like, this is about one man's obsession with this one particular thing. Sure. And you start, it's uh, Devendra, I'm sorry you missed the opening shot. Uh, <laughs> the opening shot is him. Well, it, it, it is a close up of like rain hitting puddles and him mm. looking at that and, and him thinking about having these like dreams and visions of these like quantum reactions and stuff like that. And it, this is the movie starts and he's already obsessed with that. And it follows it through to like the horrifying conclusion of him pursuing this obsession. And I think for me, because it is all so focused on that 
main thread uh, that it didn't like I didn't get the biopic feeling, which I usually feel like are like they're they're not telling a specific story. They're just like that's just like a Wikipedia article. And so getting back to what Jeff brought up, um, I think because uh, so much of I think what is really going on in this movie is communicated through just what Killian Murphy is doing non-verbally i think the imax really helps with that because you were just like your entire field of view is just this guy's face and you have no choice but to stare into his eyes and Killian think Murphy's about bony what face. what is going on and is that yeah i mean i i yeah. think it was uh was it david ehrlich's review where he says that like his cheekbones are like basically in 3d like if you see it in imax <laughs> so much death yeah. We, yeah. I, I read a thing uh, a, a while back about cinema in general and the fact that we, one of the magic things about movies and the close up is that we didn't evolve seeing the human face mm-hmm. that close. You never, in life, you never speak to someone right up at them. <laughs> you're, you, you're, you're never that close to another human face having a conversation. But with the, the advent of the camera, the motion picture camera, we were able to put that right here and you're able to be so close to a human being's face that it was anathema to anything that humans had ever experienced before. But we had evolved to read these minute detail and read emotion and meaning from the human, from the tiniest of human. So like having that amplified and then taking it to the IMAX level, it just feels <laughs> like something that the human, human beings, it's like mm-hmm. drinking from the fire hose of something we were evolved to pick up on far away. You know, I can, yeah. I can imagine a couple of things I want to add here. Um, I, I, I think I still do want to see this thing in IMAX, but I I was thinking back to Interstellar and what Interstellar did with IMAX and really using that full frame to take us to deep space, like take us to somewhere we'll never be. And I think specifically for the set piece where we do actually see a bomb go off and we see a mushroom cloud, like I I want to see like how does IMAX take advantage of that? Because like we that's something I oh, I hope to God we will never actually see in person. Mm-hmm. But this mm-hmm. is kind of like the only way to experience that. And um, yeah, I, I don't think it delivers had... that. Um, well, I felt like that sequence well, does. But yeah, uh, Patrick Willems, uh, I'm curious, what percentage of the film yeah. do, would you say is it in full frame IMAX? Uh, a surprisingly large amount. Hmm. Uh, so it is. I, if I am correct, uh, so anything that's not IMAX, I believe, is it still shot in either 65 or 70 millimeter? It's supposed to be 65. Yeah, 65. From what I read. And yeah. so it's a thing where, and it's not, there's nothing in like anamorphic. So it's basically between like, kind of like, I think 1851 and then going square. So it's already like a fairly yeah. tall aspect ratio. And um, it will do it sometimes like within a scene. Like I, mm. I, I'm not talking like this is Michael not Bay Transformers. Transformers from like, last night. It is not yeah, that. It'll where cut it's like, back and forth like 18 <laughs> times between different aspect ratios. Right? Yeah, yeah, it's not that, but it it will be a thing sometimes, and and it's almost always for like a single person close up. Uh, mm. It'll be a thing like in this is not a spoiler. Uh, when you see in the black and white section, uh, uh, Robert Downey Jr.'s character. Um, sitting in uh, that room, is it is it in like Norway or something where Oppenheimer is is like a it's kind of embarrassing him um, mm-hmm. in in like a talk he's he's giving and just this like giant like shot of Downey sitting there as the camera like very steadily kind of like dollies in and it's this it's this razor thin depth of field and so it's only him in focus and. Yeah. You know, it's just you're just looking at this guy reacting silently, and um, and and it's that kind of shot mostly throughout. It is it is like single close ups, and uh, and then you know, of course, aerial establishing shots, the yeah. bomb. But uh, I, I mean, for instance, yeah. this is the opposite of that. But when they first cut to uh, those guys riding horses uh, through New Mexico. Right. Uh, and, and just the, the scale of, of this, of this aerial shot as it just goes from like huge, uh, wide shot down to like, you know, until you can actually like register like the faces of them. It is, uh, 
I, I think that's what's so interesting about the use of IMAX. You have like the 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 giant sweeping vistas and also the closest close-ups you've ever seen in your entire life. Yeah. And it's actually useful mm-hmm. for Patrick to describe this to everyone because uh, the majority of people will not be able to watch it in the way that Christopher Nolan intended. It's very unfortunate. Yeah. Uh, so, um, so, sorry, everybody, if you're like yeah, getting FOMO, like listening this. to yeah. this. It's, um, uh, yeah, J- yeah. So, uh, Jeff, uh, I feel like we actually, not we, you know, on this podcast necessarily, but like we as a society had a similar conversation when Quentin Tarantino's The Hateful Eight came out. Yeah. That Which movie was shot with, uh, with, was shot using Ultra Panavision 70. Mm-hmm. And it takes place mostly indoors. And I remember, this is the sequence I remember. Maybe it's not quite accurate, but I remember one of us saying on this podcast something along the lines of, um, hey, like it's weird that he felt the need to shoot in. Ultra Panda Vision 70, and the whole movie takes place inside. And mutual friend, and I, I don't want to call him out, but like, because I don't have his permission, but mutual friend Dan Trachtenberg, <laughs> I want to say, pinged me and was like, I don't know why you'd give Quentin Tarantino a difficult time about that, because like, why wouldn't you just view it as an aesthetic decision? Mm-hmm. Like, yeah, it doesn't, sure, sure, you, sure. you don't, it doesn't need to be big vistas for you to use Ultra Panda Vision 70. And so, mm-hmm. um, that's kind of how I view the, I agree with you, Jeff, like, we associate IMAX with like this is when the transformer hits the other transformer. Well, we associate yeah. it in in large part because because of, of what, the dark how night, right. Nolan has used it. Agreed, agreed. No, no doubt, no doubt. Um, but I think he's obviously not using it that way here. And I think and he's, I, I, he's, yeah, I, yes, yeah. I agree. And and I I am of two minds about it because mm-hmm. on one hand I think it's incredible to leverage that specific technology in this way and to use. And, and to be able to display what is, you know, what is really a courtroom drama with flashbacks, uh, you know, and display it with that kind of majesty. There is something powerful about that mm-hmm. for sure. I mean, I saw it on a huge screen in, with, projected in 70 millimeter. It's beautiful, right? I can only imagine that when it fills an IMAX screen, it's even more so. Yeah. But yeah. this is just my own personal aesthetic choice. If I'm going to have to, you know, bend myself into all sorts of knots to get to an IMAX screen to experience right. it, mm-hmm. sure. This isn't the movie that's going to be high priority for me to do that. And it yeah. doesn't necessarily mean that I needed to have, you know, a giant action set piece, but it is kind of what Devinter was talking about of like being falling into the screen, being transported in, into space mm-hmm. or whatever it is, feels like a compelling reason to rush to the theater, like having this sort of transportive yeah. thing. Yeah. And, and, and maybe that's just my own taste. No, I, th- I think that's very reasonable, Jeff. I that's think, fair. Yeah. I think it's a function of the scarcity of IMAX, right? Maybe if right. they were everywhere, you wouldn't feel the same way. Right. right? Also, I the, feel like I should have actually seen it a different way the second time. So I can compare them <laughs> yeah. because yeah. all yeah. I can yeah. say is like, yeah. well, I love this movie anyway. And I also <laughs> saw it in the best possible format. So yeah. yeah. There's one me, last, I will, yeah. Uh, what I want to see in IMAX, and I can't really, is the screen open full when Tom Cruise shoots a motorcycle off a cliff. Like, <laughs> yeah. That's what I want to see. Yeah, indeed. Uh, there's one last thing I wanted to mention that kind of Patrick and, and Jeff have been talking about. I, uh, I thought you guys, you might have already seen this story, uh, but Jeff, I definitely thought you might enjoy this. Basically, talking about how talented Killian Murphy and Al Pacino are. <laughs> Uh, Christopher Nolan gave an interview recently where he said, talking about like Al Pacino filmed Insomnia with with uh, Christopher Nolan. And uh, Christopher Nolan said, quote, I'd gone up to Al Pacino after a series of takes and gave him a note on what I wanted. <laughs> and Al Pacino told me, I've already done that. You can see it. You can't see it to the eye, but I've done it to the dailies. Okay. And I looked for it in the dailies and I was like, oh my God, there it was. Great film actors can do that, and that's what I had with yeah. Killian. You, do, you don't give Al Pacino notes, okay? Uh, it's, just, it's just amazing that basically he thinks both <laughs> Al Pacino and Killian Murphy are operating mm-hmm. at a level that is not visible to the human eye, but that if you look at the dailies, you can see. Well, and this I think is the thing yeah. we're talking about. I mean, yeah. especially yeah. on an IMAX screen, like the, mm-hmm. what, the kind of work you need to, to do when you know your face is going to be... Yeah presented four stories it's high. It's so subtle. It's so subtle, it's right? Not, yeah. It's le- you know, th- th- mm-hmm. there's a great uh, Ben Kingsley quote, Sir Ben Kingsley, he's very particular about that. Um, <laughs> Sir Ben King- Kingsley quote where he says, uh, every take he tries to do less. Mm. He's like, if you give me another take, my goal will be to do less. Love do it. less. Love it. Uh, and yeah. I think that's amazing. Um, all, you know, also, uh, if you guys have not seen 
the the clip that's going around online right now of Robert Downey Jr. sitting next to Killian Murphy, Murphy and like won't shut up about how amazing he thinks <laughs> Killian Murphy's performance is, <laughs> yeah. it's well worth seeking out because mm. it's like, here's a guy who's been around doing the acting thing his entire life, second generation filmmaker, like knows he's shit, been in countless movies, biggest movie star on the planet for, you know, stretches yeah. of his life, sitting next to a, a, a Killian Murphy and just like won't shut up about how good he thinks he is in this movie. It's pretty cool. That's Indeed. pretty great. Indeed. One thing I want to mention there, I have a conspiracy theory. I do think Christopher Nolan is just obsessed with Killian Murphy's eyes because <laughs> Batman Begins, I think his scarecrow work is really fun, but also the key moment in Inception is him crying at the end. And it's like, you, you hire that guy for those baby blues, basically. Mm. Well, so, I mean, yeah. look at those Indeed. eyes. You can't look at those that. eyes. Indeed. Yeah. All right. We have, we have so much more to discuss about yep. Oppenheimer. Let's get to spoilers starting right now. We are now talking about spoilers for Christopher Nolan's Oppenheimer. Jeff, I think it's a, a good place to start your point about what this movie is trying to say about Oppenheimer, right? Sure. And, and does it redeem him in any way? Um, I think that, it, in my opinion, the movie tells the story from the perspective of Oppenheimer, right? Sure, yeah. And in some ways, that inherently uh, does kind of put us in his perspective and make us try to see the world as he sees it. And so it does kind of make us sympath. There's, there's an inherently sympathetic way that that makes us feel about Oppenheimer. Um, to the film's credit, I do think that uh, it shows that Oppenheimer uh, was a naive and that his naivete is proven out, right? Mm -hmm. Like he's like, Oh, well once, once everyone realizes how dangerous this thing is, no one's going to fight at all wars. It's going no, no to fight. It's going to be awesome. Uh, and I think we all know that that didn't turn out well. And I think that like mm -hmm. his realization of that naivete is yeah. is depicted on screen in rather compelling fashion. And people um, constantly call him out on that shit too, on not like taking a stand right, against this right, earlier. Exactly. So, uh, yeah. yeah. And and I do think he is quite he is shown to be not only wrong and naive, but also quite tortured at at the decisions that mm -hmm. he's made. Now, is that um, is that in contradiction with what you said? I don't know. Um, but I, I am very sympathetic to your view that. Yeah, like telling the story of Oppenheimer from his perspective, in some way redeems him. But Jeff, did you want to elaborate a little bit on like what you mean? Yeah, I mean, I, I think um, I think I agree with everything you just said in that it it is it is a a side effect of the POV yeah. that the movie is trying to take. But I I would criticize the choice of the filmmaker to to do that in in, yeah. in a sense yeah. because I don't know if I don't know if that serves this historical tale as well as it could mm -hmm. um because i think the movie plays his arrogance as a virtue i think it plays his womanizing as no big deal i think it plays you know that there's a lot of things about his life that are you know i think we are supposed to see him as a hero who got wrongly accused of 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 things and there's a clear villain established who is like yeah. trying to do him dirty and all he was ever trying to do is like you know it's like it, it feels he was very just trying to do the science like it, he just it's... wants to make a bomb that can kill all the human race <laughs> just wants that's to see where he wants. the formulas of quantum physics take him let that's all. the man make the bomb to, pr to, pr to prove to uh, paraphrase aaron sorkin which this movie very much does <laughs> yes let Oppenheimer be Oppenheimer. Okay? <laughs> right. Right. Let him cook nuclear yeah. fission. Let him, cook thing, nuclear fission. The, let him cook nuclear fission. <laughs> the other thing that I think is problematic about that take, and and listen, no, I, I think understand. You're right, yeah. I I went I went to see a movie called Oppenheimer, not mm -hmm. the making of right. the A-bomb, right? Yes. Yeah. However, some of the most interesting stuff about that time period, that that moment of history. It is like the guy that decided to give the secrets to the Soviets. Like that's a pretty interesting <laughs> thing. And the movie is like, has that happening in the periphery, but it's played only as Oppie didn't do it. <laughs> like, right. Yeah, yeah, they're they're Oppie, a, you know? The, so uh, there's a YouTube channel called Veritasium, very famous YouTube channel um, that made a 30 minute long YouTube video about Oppenheimer's life. Um, watching that YouTube video helped to give me so much more context for why stuff was shown in the movie. Like for instance, mm -hmm. there's a scene in the movie where somebody's getting a haircut and they realize that so-and-so has split the atom, 
you know? And so they like run out of the barber shop and they're like, hey, did you see? And the newspaper, so it's just with the ad. I'm like, what an odd scene to just put randomly <laughs> in the middle of the movie. And, and you yeah. realize like, that's how it happened in real life. Right. Uh, That's how it happened in real life with someone was getting a haircut and Christopher Nolan was like, oh, what a delightful detail. I must put that in the film. Wait, but it ends, d- Dave, it, you need the YouTuber to confirm this for you. I also, d- David, yeah. to be fair, uh, w- the scene is not about the guy getting the haircut. Oppenheimer is walking down the street and sees a guy run out of the barber shop and then mm-hmm. runs after to be like, what is going on? Complete, well, completely fair. But I guess I just feel like, yeah. Uh, you know, the, the the as you said, Patrick, like the worst of a biopic can be we're just hitting these notes from a Wikipedia entry. And that's sometimes what the film felt like to me. And in particular, yeah. with characters like the Casey Affleck character or Jeff, you know, the people who like, so, you know, it's offhanded. Hey, this guy that was in, in all the scenes of the movie. Oh, by the way, he like portrayed the U.S. You know, whatever. No big deal. And yeah, we'll like the whole point again. of it is like, don't <laughs> accuse Oppie of that bad thing because he didn't know anything about Oppie's it. And it's I, like, yeah, the, evidently there is a movie coming out very soon, a, a, a documentary called The Compassionate Spy that is all about that thing, mm-hmm. about the guy who is like, in order to save the world, we can't have one person have the A-bond. We have to have not person, one, yeah, one country. entity. That's fascinating. Yeah, that, yeah. and, and literally his whole that. position yeah. is like, the only way that we all don't, you know, conform to one super, if we have one superpower, that's bad. If we have two superpowers, that is less enough bad that it has to happen. <laughs> then, then they're at a standstill. Then they could just point guns at each other. But Jeff, right. to what you're saying, this movie definitely mythologizes the character too. Like there's one scene that I cannot get out of my head. And it's when, um, you know, David Krumholtz's character, who I love, who is out there just taking care, taking it, eat something, buddy, um, <laughs> taking care of Oppenheimer. And uh, he, he was like, you know, why are you dressed in this military outfit? Be yourself. Oppenheimer goes to his bat cave <laughs> and laid out this his uniform, the hat. The yeah. <laughs> And he yeah. puts it on like Batman putting on the cape. I'm like, well, yeah, clearly the movie is telling us something like it, it, this figure who we always see in pictures, the skinny face, the pipe and the fedora hat like that is it. Now, I think the movie is guilty of mythologizing him just because he is so fascinating. I think Nolan does get overboard in that respect. On yeah. that note, I don't know if I told you guys. I don't think I told you. Somebody showed up to my Oppenheimer press screening cosplaying as Oppenheimer. Like, oh, my this God. Is a, it's not hard. He, he was hard. a, he was a <laughs> guys i la- so it was you think maybe that's just how he dresses <laughs> yeah, so sorry one sec let me uh put on my hat oh, oh, uh, okay. oh. sorry this is <laughs> the closest thing i had um yeah. but i so at the theater last night it was fascinating because you know just being in the lobby there were so many people cosplaying for barbie uh, i really enjoyed seeing people dressed in like like women in like full pink dresses going up the escalator to the IMAX uh, theater being like, oh, okay, they're, they just did Barbie. They're doing the whole Barbenheimer thing. But I, uh, I actually, I should send this to you, uh, to you guys. Um, I took a photo of this in the lobby, a group of six dudes, six friends, <laughs> all posing in front of the giant cardboard standee for Oppenheimer, uh-huh. all wearing their, their fedoras. No. So, so people, people showed up dressed. It's really bringing out the theme. worst. You're yeah. right. <laughs> Just real fans of mutually assured destruction. You know? So actually one thing that uh, I, I, I wanted to bring up in relation to uh, what Jeff was talking about is uh, we've been making comparisons to different movies that this reminded us of, um, you know, uh, walk biopics, hard. walk <laughs> hard. Um, I, JFK. I, uh, JFK, Jeff, you brought up uh, Danny Boyle's Steve Jobs, yes, uh, which which is one that I, I also thought about during the movie. But I feel like like the most obvious Point of comparison is Miyazaki's *The Wind Rises*. Mm, because good call. Good that, I thought you were yeah, going to say a yeah. beautiful mind, but go ahead. Uh, <laughs> I, not, not I, yeah, does Alzheimer have a beautiful mind? Mm, uh, kind of does, but yeah. because you know *The Wind Rises* set same time period, uh, just about the country they're at war with. Um, And that is another movie about a filmmaker making a biopic about someone that probably in some ways 
they like see like some some resemblance uh, to some like they see themselves like reflected to an extent back in this real person. Mm -hmm. And The Wind Rises is about a man who is obsessed with flight. And all he wants to do is build airplanes because he thinks they are beautiful. He thinks of himself as an artist. And then it turns out the one way to actually like make his dreams a reality to, to build these beautiful things is through warfare is by building machines of death that will ha have guns on them and drop bombs and it is a movie about wrestling with uh you know that yeah. moral dilemma of like you know i uh, are are my personal dreams and my own own fulfillment and my obsessions worth the end result of them and that i think is exactly it's what exactly Oppenheimer it. is about well yeah. but yeah. do you think do you think you came away from this film with an understanding of Oppenheimer's uh, internal life other than an, obs an obsessive uh, thirst for science. It, do you think that is enough? Here's my point. I feel like this movie speaks to the ideologies that were surrounding the moment mm -hmm. and only tells us what Oppenheimer does not believe, right? Mm. It, there, there is so much spoken about like, oh, he was a member of the Communist Party, but guys, he didn't believe it. He didn't actually. Oh, he was never flirting. He was never flirting with. He was never a member of the. You know, yeah. like, there was all this stuff. I, I never got any insight into what he actually yeah. does believe. Like, I wish what movie... is his ideology other than yeah. I believe in science, and I think maybe that's maybe that's the sum total of it but i suspect not i suspect there's more it's more sophisticated than that but this movie isn't interested it's only trying to defend him mm -hmm. against the accusation that he was a communist it does rather bring than up actually trying to present yeah what he was where his ideologies were resting it does bring up some ideas and i think like the romances and i think like the female relationships like it just like puts things out there. It's like, oh, puts out breadcrumbs and expects you to draw the dots to them. But, you know, as a Jewish scientist and also David Krumholtz's character is a Jewish scientist, and I think he felt that, that like, th there was something happening here, especially, you know, with with everything happening in Germany. Like, he felt an urge to do something yeah. that I wish the movie had, like, conveyed that more if well, that was the, actually a thing. Yeah. The, 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 I think his ideology... So, Jeff, I agree yeah. with you. It's not super deep mm -hmm. as conveyed in the film. Um, but I think his ideology is best summed up in the conversation he has with David Krumholtz, where David Krumholtz is like, sorry, can't, can't do this. Can't help yeah. build something that's going to kill people. And he's like, look, I don't know if it's the right thing to build the bomb, but like, I know that it's the wrong thing for the Nazis to have it. Right. Yeah. Like, yes. And so yes. whatever the case, we need to stop them from being the first ones. I get that. And I think that's but, powerful, but I feel like the, go ahead. Which then, which then like he's, which is like a very understandable thing to be motivated by they mm -hmm. could be motivated by but then what happens obviously is well it turns out we don't really need to use it against the nazis and yeah. oh well the japanese we can still say some lies but maybe we actually didn't need to do that you know like and so he he starts with these very positive or not positive but like reasonable intentions yeah. that then get obviously twisted and distorted until his creation is used for something that he didn't even want in the first place and that's why it's a tragedy right but yeah i agree with you jeff that it's like fundamentally it's like oh it's about this guy who like had good intentions and then it went badly but he, like, he's so smart but so dumb but the about, guy like, was at yeah. least like not that bad right so uh, yeah, yeah I, I wish the movie had spent more time on that idea too that hitler's dead right germany's defeated we have japan here and what what is that situation like i wish i would love to see more exploration of the alternatives or the people who are just like yeah we, we got to do this we got to destroy that and that's something I think about a lot like what we did what america did to japan is an awful like earth shattering event and i think we don't really reckon with that too much i was almost hoping like this movie we see the bomb sequence like halfway through this movie pretty much i was like okay what's the final hour like will we get actually uh oppenheimer like um you know fantasizing about like being there in person or seeing it or going through that experience kind that's of. something we see kind of. in the james mangold movie the wolverine 
we don't see it. <laughs> well, he doesn't here. have that whole fantasy sequence yeah. of seeing the woman with the charred face. Yeah, he pants. sees like right. he sees the people in the audience, but like I would have liked that they would have gotten news footage, they would have gotten photos, they would have gotten like the experience of the people on the ground, and rather than him just being in his own head, being like, "Am I guilty? I don't well, he, know, guys." There's the scene where he's yeah. literally watching the footage. Yeah, uh, we don't see the footage, thankfully, <laughs> but uh, you know, he he watches. I for me, the more yeah. chilling scene is the sort of dispassionate meeting where it's like, where should we bomb? Well, I don't want to go bomb yeah, there because we yeah. might, we vacationed there. It's lovely. You know, that that was like, oh, gee, Awful. they're literally talking about hundreds of thousands of people being incinerated. And he's like, yeah. my wife yeah. and I did our honeymoon there. And so uh, I, I'd yeah, rather if not- If he'd gone to a honeymoon in a different mm -hmm. place, like the different set of people would be- It's go. just, uh, just it, it, chilling. It, it is worth discussing yeah. just, I just, for a brief moment, um, mm -hmm. I don't think there's a single Asian person in this entire film, if no. I recall correctly, right? And not that I recall. I, I no. don't look. Not all movies need to be all things, and clearly Christopher Nolan wanted to tell this specific story. I personally was actually okay with the way he told it, but there's been some people who are like, you know, what? It, like uh, Japanese people were completely erased from this movie, and it's like, uh, I understand why he chose to not show it because it's like then he's kind of like profiting off of. You know, the movie's like profiting off of or using their misery and, and suffering, um, at least in the context of the story that he's trying to tell. Like if, if they had showed it dropping and, and showed the footage or whatever, then it, it it would feel, I think, weirder to me than the approach that they chose. But I do think I just think it's worth noting that they mm -hmm. took that approach, which is like we're just we're not even going to deal with any of the consequences up close, even though we're that's gonna... what that's what the movie is ultimately about towards the end. Like exactly. his whole so feeling. It's, it's, so... it's kind of an odd you know, I, I I understand why they did it that way, and I, I don't. I'm not saying yeah. they should have done it a different way, but it's it's at least worth noting that they did it. I'm thinking it of the way. movie. Um, I don't know if you guys have ever seen Tora Tora Tora, but that is that is a movie that both has the American and Japanese perspective right. exactly of exactly. that experience. And like that would have been something. Just yeah, but I it's, feel like it's not the story that he wanted to tell. And so not. I understand. This but, is yeah, based on a biography, right. and that's what the biography. Unless is doing. he just, pulls yeah. a Clint Eastwood and yes. then goes mm. and makes the uh, yes. the movie <laughs> about. <laughs> I don't know, a Japanese scientist? Yeah. Opposite yeah. Heimer? Mm. Perhaps, perhaps. Um, speaking of, let's talk about some of the other filmmaking choices, okay? Um, I think this is the most subjective one of Christopher Nolan's movies. Th there's more, like, dreamlike stuff happening in this movie than in Inception, in my opinion, mm -hmm, which is about mm -hmm. dreams. Like, <laughs> you see, like, random flashes of visions, and then... Um, <laughs> People having sex inside like these hearing rooms. Like the um, poor Florence Pugh. I thought, was, I thought it was. I thought it was weird. I didn't. Yeah. I didn't think it worked for me. I wish filmmakers like Spielberg and Nolan would stop showing sex scenes intercut with other things that are happening at the same time. Um, that sex scene. Let first Dave of all. enjoy the sex scene. <laughs> let Dave enjoy the sex scene. The sex scene, the first one with Florence Pugh, by the way, was was the thing that started all those articles like, this movie is going to have a prolonged, steamy sex scene. And it is 30 seconds. And Florence Pugh pulls a book and they have and sex she, while reading the Bhagavad Gita. And she Gita. asks you to start reading it while they're having sex, which is like well, a normal, that's a normal that's thing a that totally most people thing. do, right? No, so. that, that was when I, I did want to shout out. I was like, oh, Christopher Nolan just does not know humans. Like, does not understand humans. <laughs> Human yeah, it, it felt like it felt it's like someone, so, someone yeah. who has like some kind of clinical understanding of sex making a movie about this. Patrick Williams, <laughs> what did like, you think of? I, no, I like that the, that she opens the book. Yeah, yeah. And randomly Translated asked him to me. pick the one thing we've all heard <laughs> yeah. from Sanskrit. Yeah. You know, yeah. yeah. it is Patrick Williams. Uh, yeah, what do you think? Genuinely, like straight up, uh, that <laughs> the addition. I mean, there, there's two sex scenes in this movie mm -hmm. and one of them is a dream uh yeah. but the first one like hands down one of my favorite scenes in the movie i'm just like <laughs> other than just like the sheer shock of witnessing <laughs> sex in a christopher nolan movie true like when when they announced mm -hmm. the rating for this and it said for like rated r for some sexual content i was like this must be a, a typo like <laughs> what's happening here in, in, in a christopher nolan movie like like impossible but uh but just <laughs> Just the sheer image of like Oppenheimer lay, <laughs> laying back in bed uh -huh. while a a, a woman <laughs> climbs on top of him and at <laughs> to to perform intercourse while <laughs> he reads uh, the Sanskrit "I am become death, destroyer of worlds." Mm -hmm. I'm like that is like we have the act of 
you know, of, of creation and the words of, of like Armageddon, like, you yeah. know, like on Amazing. top of each other. Amazing. It is like, Oh, wonderful well, symbolism, Patrick. Yes. I, I, yes. I do not care how unsubtle it is. I, I I'm like, that, that, this, that, this is like right here. I'm, I'm like, we have like, <laughs> like I get this guy, like, like right here. He is like, that, that was, I don't know. That was the point where I was like, Christopher Nolan does not have friends. He does not have friends. <laughs> who's like, the... buddy, buddy, <laughs> buddy let's let's take this step See, back. that was the moment where i was like hell yeah this is my yeah, movie yeah, yeah. of the year let's go i mean go. he well he, yeah he, he definitely feels like a robot trying to understand human yes. beings the yeah. moment yes. later on is i think even more like equally bizarre when i think that one it works because it's the wife from like thinking but about we're, that we're in emily and, yeah. blunt's perspective a perspective that we are basically not in for Never most get. of the movie so i'm like why are you showing us Emily Blunt's perspective? In any so I, I thought it was quite odd, but also mm -hmm. yes, it it does give you some insight into how Christopher Nolan thinks, which right. I guess is how, a, how does some he value, think? right? I, so. I will say I think as far as the second scene goes, I'm like I'm of two minds about it. Like I think it is actually like a very effective scene. Uh, yeah. I th yeah. like I, th I think the reveal of it, the way the camera dollies and Oppenheimer is is now shirtless yeah. 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 yeah and um it, it's like my one issue is just that it's the only time that we're really not not the only time but it's uh because like we we see a couple parts where like you know with emily blunt, emily blunt where like you know she gets the phone call and stuff like that but this is the only time we like really subjectively go into yep. what she's like what's in her head and uh and i'm like this is i think a very effective scene in terms of like, I I I think it is powerfully communicating what it intends to. I just I do just wonder like, why is this the only moment exactly that we have that with mm -hmm. her? Exactly, that's that's my issue with it. It's not the concept; it's that it happens in the rest of the context of this film. Um, let's talk about the bomb going off, guys. Uh, I thought this sequence was really pretty masterful. Like some of the best Nolan, you know the. It, it, most of the movie honestly feels like a heist, like Inception mm -hmm. style, where like they're trying to do this thing and then they finally gotta put the pull team together. Off. And of course, yeah, it's very yeah. horrifying. Like the implications are horrifying to comprehend and behold. Um, but just as a as a pure piece of, I, I know I know Jeff, you said you wouldn't describe it as a set piece, so I I, I can ag agree with that. But I think just as a sequence, yeah, I, no, very very effective. It. Just like the mm -hmm. the way it's shot and edited, like you see it before you hear it, and. Uh, I will tell you, my packed theater was completely silent. Yeah, as the movie, like as the movie itself, is completely silent during that movie. It's a really powerful moment of awe and terror. I think I had but, the yeah. thought. Yeah. Listen, I agree with you that it is an, an an amazing sequence. Not gonna just like full stop. Yeah, it's an amazing sequence. I do think I had the thought. Uh, while I was watching it, that this, it, as it was approaching, I was like, this is the motorcycle jump off the cliff yes. moment. Mm. This is the thing we all knew this movie had to get to. Yep. It was what everybody was talking about. Here is Nolan going to show off how he does his own stunts. There's no CGI here, right? I'm doing my own stunts. How am I going to do it? Are you ready? Are you ready? Are you ready? And I think it isn't about that at all. Right, I think it is an effective scene for zero reasons that I, at least, I will only speak for myself, but I think a lot of people were anticipating it coming up in the movie. In that, mm -hmm. it's like, oh my gosh, you actually blew up a bomb. No, 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 no. What's it, what's effective about that sequence, from my perspective, is that we are seeing it through these people's eyes and the tension of will it happen? Will it not happen? Will it end the world? And yeah. will it of, kill everyone here? That which is also a possibility, you know. And yeah. and the sort of um, the sort of variety of reactions that we yeah. get yeah. Uh, are, I mean, some amazing subtlety there in this like complicated moment of we did the thing, and also it is horrifying what we did, and then that like rousing sort of cheering moment where we literally have Oppenheimer framed in front of the American flag. And mm -hmm. it's like, and it's so hollow and you go, Oh my God, they did a terrible, terrible thing. Yeah. Um, I thought all of that was spectacular. And for me, 0% of it percentage of it is how did he pull off the visualization of the bomb? Because ultimately it's just a big bright light. And yeah. that's, 
that's fine because the scene isn't about that. I mm-hmm. agree with you, Jim. I think that's really well said. Patrick Willems, any thoughts on on the kind of that that sequence, that, which is arguably the climax of the film? Yeah, I, I mean, no. Uh, basically, I'm just going to echo what Jeff was just saying. It is like it is like again, like the uh, the I think the most striking images in that scene are just when like kind of the close ups where it's just the entire screen is just like rolling fire. Like when it gets mm-hmm. really surreal, it's like you're, you're, you're in yeah. too close to even really determine like what you're looking at. Uh, but yeah, I, I, I think the, like the point of the scene is really just like how everyone reacts to it. Yeah. And, and it's funny because all the talk about the movie, especially like hearing no one say like, Oh, we were not going to use any CGI for, you know, for the bomb. And everyone's like, you know, making the jokes about like, Oh, he like actually detonated a nuke for real and stuff like that. And then after the movie, I'm just like, that's, not even like very good scene but that's not like you would think that the bomb detonation scene would be the scene in Oppenheimer everyone would be like thinking about afterwards and I'm like no that's like I don't know maybe like number 10 on my list oh wow I for me honestly the scene that I remember more is the one that happens after the bomb goes off where Oppenheimer is giving a speech to all the people that are like hooting and hollering (laughs) and they're like yeah great job um do you know what it reminded me of guys this is a deep cut Mm. The Animatrix, the second renaissance. Okay? Yes. yes. Part one there, or part two, Dave? <laughs> I, don't, I don't remember which part, but there's a scene in the Animatrix, the second renaissance, uh, which is the anime version of Matrix stuff, where they tell the backstory of what happened before the Matrix. And there's a scene where like the UN decides that they're going to black out the sky, I think, to, to uh, attack the machines. And everyone's applauding this plan. They're like, yeah, great plan. And then like you see the humans become skeletons clapping. Mm-hmm. And it was like that always stuck in my head that like humans might like applaud their own destruction. Um, might. It really, <laughs> it really stuck with me. And it, it reminded me so much of this scene where Oppenheimer is going into this room. Everyone's hearing. And the sound design of that scene is incredible because and I, I, for a moment, because we'd had projection problems, I almost wondered, if something mm-hmm. went wrong with the projection, like, <laughs> did you, was there like a part of the soundtrack that was missing? Because you hear like, <laughs> you hear people like standing up in the chairs, but you don't hear any of their audio. You don't hear mm-hmm. any of their voices. Yeah. And, and, and it's just like, and then all of a sudden it like smash cuts to, then you hear them again and then you stop here. And it's, a, it's incredible because you can feel like his world is just becoming unmoored. Like he under, he realizes like the implications of what he's done. Um, and it, he's like spiraling. He can't even perceive reality anymore. It's um, I thought yeah. it was really fascinating. Scene, I think so. that whole sequence is part of the bonk sequence. Honestly, like it is, you know, sure. it's it's fucking around and it's finding out. And that's that's <laughs> ultimately that yeah. that is that is those two sequences put together. Personally, I do want to know how they made the visuals for the bomb. I think that'd be kind of interesting. But the way they shot it is like you're looking at the surface of the sun. And I do yeah. think that part of it is really interesting. I the the impact of the visual seeing it before you feel it to you is very from what i've read that is how a lot of these things happen yeah. um i thought that was just pretty like lightning well and thunder well. yeah yeah exactly exactly yeah, mm-hmm. um, yeah I, actually I, uh, dave if, if i could say a bit more about please. the scene you were just talking about because please. i think yeah. that that is like you know one of the uh, you know one of the, the the great scenes in the movie agreed, but i mean agreed. just yeah. as far as the sound design goes i the way that like initially just the the pounding feet like sound yeah. like an explosion and yeah. a thing that that struck me uh on on second viewing is when oppenheimer is sorry when oppie is uh is walking out of the the building afterwards and everyone is losing their minds. Um, A thing that that they repeat a couple times is he'll look at someone, then it cuts away, then it cuts back to the person he looks at. And each time, and like, for instance, there's one part, he looks at a woman who is like, like laughing and looks like looks so happy, and then it comes yeah, back to Oppenheimer, and, and then he looks at her again, and then she's like sobbing, and then he sees two yeah. people who are like making out under the bleachers, and then he looks back at them and like, and they seem to be crying. Right, he goes one of out, them's like consoling the other. Right? Exactly. Yeah. He goes outside, yeah. and there's a guy like vomiting with yeah. like <laughs> snot coming out of his nose, and uh, and you know, like. D- all of these things. I mean, look, I'm I'm thinking it all comes back to the sex scene with Florence Pugh, where he is having sex while also thinking about uh, destroying the world. <laughs> yeah, as we all do. I mean, as, as we all do I mean, every day. We've shame. all been That's there. All I'm yeah, I will um, tell you that I was stunned. I, I mentioned this earlier. I was stunned that there was an hour of movie left after the bomb goes <laughs> off, and 
I found the other stuff to be so much lower stakes and so much less interesting to me than the bomb stuff, uh, than the building the bomb stuff. But I'm curious, you know, how it worked for you guys, because I think Patrick certainly mm-hmm. worked much better for you. Like, the movie ends with, I think, Rami Malek giving testimony at yeah. this hearing to try to take down Robert Downey Jr. That's that's kind of the culminate, well, the, it was, you know, uh, the final event of the movie, right? What's his face? Uh, whose name I'm I'm not not even thinking of right now. But that whole, that final hour has uh, some really interesting sequences. I think they're meeting the president. Meeting, yeah, you know, um, yeah, Gary yeah. Oldman as Gary Truman. Oldman, yeah, pretty, pretty, Gary pretty Oldman cool. really good, yeah. and also like the it just as disheartening as the picking the place to bomb in Japan scene. It was like, yeah, he's trying to do something, and the president's like, get out of there, this is my <laughs> thing, and I don't want to yeah. talk to that whiner again, yeah. Um, all that stuff I think worked real well. The trial, I think, is really well done, but the, but the problem is not like, a trial, oh, Devendra, as people not, as not point out in the movie 18 times, but yep, not a trial, <laughs> but also the Senate hearing afterwards, I think, are both really well done. But here's again where I wish we had more of a perspective from Emily Blunt's character because when we go every night, it's just her yelling at them, Why aren't you fighting back with a drink in her hand? She's at the <laughs> she's at the meeting with a drink in her bag, and um, <laughs> it's just the same thing. Over and over again. She well, has we, one great scene where yeah, she, that scene in, that scene where yeah. she takes him takes down the prosecutor uh, yeah. is pretty pretty great. But, pretty yeah. fantastic. Yeah. I just wish like leading up to that, it was a little more than one note. That's all. Yeah. Um, Willems, what did you think of of how this movie ended? The last hour. Uh, so on my first viewing, this was the this stretch was the one where I was the most kind of unsure how I felt about it. Uh, uh, and I think, you know, part of this is just like, there are so many names and so much information and we are jumping around so much in time and I'm like trying to, trying to work out all of it. And then on second viewing this, like this, all this stuff all clicked really hard for me. I mean, I, I think, you know, the basic point of it is just, uh, you know, it's spending all this time on just like, I, I, again, we've brought up this guy's naivety, uh, like but already, but like, you know, he was a scientist who just who really wanted to do he do his work and pursue this obsession, and um, and then you know afterwards, this is just you know America's military industrial complex basically being like, you know, you know we can't tolerate this guy who 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 actually mm-hmm. wants us to not keep going with this and uh and so we like we we it doesn't matter if he was like on the cover of time magazine and you know we called him a hero uh we will we will bury anyone who tries to get in the way of um of us building bigger and bigger bombs and um and then i think one of the most compelling parts of it is at some point when emily blunt points out uh that he's like basically like rolling over and letting them do this to him because he thinks he like deserves to be punished for for what he's like this is basically just him like through other people just like you know this is less like self-flagellation yeah. for you know for all for, like for this last stretch of the movie and then you know it it culminates in just the final the final scene, which is just him sitting there imagining, you know, that just just thinking about, uh, oh, oh, I, I, I did. Even if hitting the button didn't make the atmosphere catch on fire, uh, I, I did basically ruin the world forever. <laughs> I, I wish <laughs> the movie had spoken as clearly as you just did, honestly, because it, I will say I on feel- second viewing, it really did for me. So, I'm, I'm glad to hear that. I, I, I've only had one viewing, so perhaps my opinion would also change. But I feel like that notion that the the military mil, military industrial complex is kind of putting him through the grinder is blunt is Emily blunted because uh, <laughs> nice um, because the movie takes so much effort to establish this like very pulpy Robert Downey Jr. was pissed off that you said the one thing. And so he's going to take you down. And it's, it's, it becomes so, um, I don't know. It, I feel like a more sophisticated, interesting position for the movie to take is the one you articulated is that, you know, Hey, this larger systemic thing means that any one individual is going to get churned up and spit out no matter how important you think you are or actually mm-hmm. were to this yeah. effort. But what the movie actually is doing is creating this very Hollywood, 
like you can't handle the truth moment um, with a character who like you said one bad thing and he harbored a resentment for you for years and years and years. And the big reveal of the movie is what Einstein actually said that it wasn't about him. And there's like, there's a certain joy and satisfaction in watching Robert Downey Jr. gnash his teeth and get his comeuppance. And I, I'm not saying that wasn't effectively uh, executed, Yeah, but I don't yeah. think, I think for mm-hmm. me, that took away from what you're saying. I, th- I think yeah. it was doing both, but the movie does, it's shorthand. It does the big topics and then it does shorthand. Oh, this happened, by the way, look at this flashback. Like, look at this dream sequence. This is what I'm trying to say. And I think, I don't know. I feel like he has a hard time juggling, s- communicating effectively with these two things. Yeah. I, I agree with you, Jeff, that it reduces it down to yeah. like a petty rivalry instead yeah. of instead of I don't think of Robert Downey Jr.'s character as like he represents the military industrial complex right. necessarily. He's just mm-hmm. a dude that's pissed mm-hmm. off at Oppenheimer. Yeah. Now, I will say that what Robert Downey Jr. does represent is people throughout the movie are like trying to mess with scientists' shit. Like they're yeah. trying to like yeah. tell you, you guys don't actually know how to use we know how to use it. You know, like and so he is indicative of that, but it is a weird thing to pin the client, like the final reveal on is it's like, weird. oh, it's because um, Oppenheimer said his dad was a shoe sale, a lowly shoe salesman. And that's why Robert Downey Jr. is so pissed this whole well, time. Well, no, it's because of isotopes. It's like this guy, right, I, know. I, don't, I don't give a shit about your isotope the you know, idea yeah he suffered, isotopes let's just all agree that robert downey jr has suffered multiple indignities at his hands okay? <laughs> but, yes, yes. But it I, is interesting though that tony stark military industrialist yes, is yeah. uh i, I will also, say um mm-hmm. robert downey jr gave an interview i think it was with mm-hmm. the new york times where he expressed fear that working in marvel movies would ruin his ability to act yeah well and, i did uh, for a while say, I think he yeah. did great in this movie. I Unfortunately, was- his mm-hmm. hundreds of millions of dollars will have to console him in the future. I know, it's tough. Unfortunately. It's tough. It's tough. <laughs> but it is worth pointing out. I think this is his most like un-Tony Stark performance yes. since starting yeah. that. He like, can act like a yeah. guy that's not like Robert Downey. He's Daddy. great. I mean, to, be, to be fair, he's great Vendra, in how many mm-hmm. non-Tony Stark performances has he it's given true. since it's then? It's true. Yeah, but this is one of them. <laughs> this is one, one of I them. What do you think? Did you like uh, Robert Downey Jr. in the movie, Patrick? Yes, uh, David. I thought... He was excellent. I think, you know, here's, I'm coming in with a scorching hot take. Uh, I think the cast for this movie is very strong. What? Uh, Overall, uh, a lot of, a lot of good actors uh, doing good work. Doing good Uh, work. I will say I was uh, also glad to see that Rami Malek did get to speak. Because yeah, for the but, whole movie, whenever he yeah. shows up, he's standing like kind of behind a couple people, and I'm like, <laughs> I mean, it would like be eyes hilarious. wide, just like what? I, 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 I know, the, uh, you know, man with the largest eyes in the world. Uh, mm-hmm. But like, I'm like, did did they real? I know this is a stacked cast, but is he really there just to like stand silently? Uh, but no, he does. He does get some dialogue. But uh, he and Killian Murphy are having a large eye off. It's true. Yeah, it's, it's ultimately true. it. Yeah. The, That's uh, like, give, me the, give me those close ups. Like, back, back. Yeah. It's, I mean, actually, here's a question just for the group. Who, okay, who are our faves among, mm. among, there are so many people, mostly white men, in this movie. It is, it is surreal. Just it's like, da- like, it's David Crumholtz. It is completing the 10 things so I good. hate about you fan fiction that Chris Nolan has been doing forever. Um, but yeah, yeah, <laughs> oh, wow. it's criminal. It's He's true. awesome at this. People from that All movie have Heath Ledger. Up Nolan movies. Yeah. Yeah, yeah JGL. JGL. Where is Julia Stiles? Ooh. That, look. That would be good. The next one. Look, look I'm sure there's like a dead wife part that, uh, you know, with her name on it. <laughs> a wife who's angry about the babies all the time. Um, I... I I don't know if this was just me, but the first time I saw the trailers for this movie, I thought the Matt Damon role, I thought that was Jesse Clemens. I do feel like they're sort of like converging <laughs> mm. as like the same face. The, well, weird. the guy in real life was was quite large. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So I think yeah. that Damon was trying to get a little large for the part. Mm-hmm. That part actually did, that part of the movie did work for me. In real life, Oppenheimer mm-hmm. and the character and the guy uh, Rhodes, I th- Groves, Leslie Groves, they mm-hmm. did have like a very unlikely partnership. And I did get a sense like, hey, these are really different people that are working together to accomplish this goal. And I, I did appreciate that. So, yeah. Um, uh, also, but yeah, it, uh, it, it, as far as like the Damon stuff goes, I feel like uh, Nolan's writing some like the closest to Sorkin dialogue yes, he's ever it's very yeah. Sorkin. And, yeah. and it's, it's like, it is, look, this is a, a fairly bleak movie. 
it is surprisingly funny. People talk about Nolan as like this humorless, emotionless guy. And I think especially like a lot of the stuff with with uh, with Damon and Murphy is like mm-hmm. genuinely pretty funny. It's really funny. That sex scene that was part. also hilarious. So <laughs> it's not yeah. a laugh riot. This movie. <laughs> <laughs> also, um, I, I do have to shout out as as the guy who did five years ago do a podcast about the the filmography of Josh Hartnett. It, I, I've, Dude, I felt such pride. The heart he them. is, he is luminescent on the screen. Heart neta, the heart renaissance or the heart renaissance is upon. You know what I thought? He David, walks it, it, on screen in that in that in that um, uniform, and I'm yeah. like, we need Josh Hartnett in a reboot of the Rocketeer immediately. <laughs> oh my God, You're make right. it happen! He's the Rocketeer. He's, it, the Rocketeer. It's, he's so like I love him being just like kind of like the cool dashing friend to this like skeletal weirdo over here. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I, but yeah, I was just I was so happy to see my boy after all these years of being like Josh Hartnett's going to have a comeback. I know it. Here he is. Yeah, so between he, this I, and Black Mirror, amazing. it's a good year. Yeah. Oh yeah. I, it, another thought I had that I wonder if you guys shared is uh, I know that there's definitely an you know, an indictment of the military, military, I can say that phrase, military industrial complex. Mm-hmm. Um, however, <laughs> I did walk out of this movie thinking, and isn't it amazing that the military can just decide <laughs> to make a town in Los Alamos and yeah. leverage hundreds of thousands of people to one effort? We did that. We decided to put a man on the moon. We just did it. We just did it. Anything that happens like this now, it's private industry that does it. Well, it's, you know, like war, Google war is has a pretty decided, good, Google yeah. has decided we're going to do it. Facebook Meta has decided we're going to do it. Those are the only people that leverage these kind of resources and make things happen. And or Apple says, you know what, we're going to make the mm-hmm. best AR goggles of all time. But to, to make it clear, Jeff, war is a pretty big motivator. And I feel like that it's that the moon yeah. landing seems like it's it's a well, war yeah. against another another country. Two if billion dollars. In if only we had some dollars, global man. threats recently that would motivate us if to do only. things. If I will only. also say, Jeff, uh, I, I, I really appreciate you kind of being um, keen, uh, like keen to observe like how the movie sort of redeems Oppenheimer in whatever way it does. But I do think the movie also leaves out all the part where the people were evicted from their homes and their their businesses and homes destroyed to build those Alamos. That's just not even in the movie yeah. at all. Right. Well, um, there's that one line where he's like, yeah. give it back yeah, to give the... Back to the it's, it's like, it, oh, really? Interesting. Like, yeah, back, good, get out of good, my good, office, you moron. <laughs> good, good advice, but uh, also we didn't see the part where you took it from them depicted in the <laughs> yeah, movie. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, totally okayed that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah ag- agreed. But, um, but yes, I agree. There's something kind of awe-inspiring and also equally terrifying and upsetting about the fact that we can just conjure this thing out of nowhere. Yeah. Um, and and that's that that yeah. part is it, almost it like we can conjure the things we need right now. Yes. You know, solutions like nationalized healthcare and an end to homelessness and better public education. It would be amazing if yeah. we could put that amount of energy into well, what we did for the atomic bomb and the moon landing. Yeah. I also think the movie is intended to. I mean, I think Nolan has been explicit with this in in <laughs> interviews. Um, is intended to sort of uh, evoke the race toward AI right now. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it's it's hard not to think about how right. it's yeah. literally a for-profit endeavor, right? What yeah. is driving the, the race toward grander and grander expressions of artificial intelligence? It's uh, the quest for money. And in both the space race and the Manhattan Project, that was not the case, right? Hey, Jeff, don't worry. There's a lot of scary nationalism going on too. Trust me. <laughs> a lot of people are worried about China's AI. And it's, that is yeah. a great motivating that's, factor that's right now. That's true, so but we're you're, gonna, I think yeah. you're right about the parallels, Jeff, that like, yes, it yes. will be an un- uncontrollable force that we uh, we, we can scan, scan and, and, predict and what sa- will happen. In the same way that the researchers and scientists are defending it as the, this, this lust for uh, progress and discovery and innovation, like I think... That's kind of Oppenheimer's position, you know, as, as Patrick has repeatedly said, it's this, this desire to just sort of have this pure science. And I think there's a lot of that on the cutting edge of AI right now without regard to the, to the fallout. Yeah. And I use that or, word specifically. I mean, I, I think actually what Davinia said, like, uh, we can't have China be ahead of us, in, right. you know, and like it's that's, a huge motivating and it's like, And that right justifies yeah. whatever we need to do to, you know. Yeah. So uh, anyway. This has been a great conversation. Patrick Willems, I want to give you the last word. Any other thoughts on Oppenheimer that uh, we haven't discussed? 
Oh my God. I'm trying to think. Are there, this movie's three hours long. There's so much in there. I mean, I mean, we haven't even, we, we didn't even mention the scene where he gets pissed at his professor in college and, uh, and, and poisons his apple. Uh, a thing it that apparently happened in real life. Did, yeah. Did really yeah. Happen. yeah. Happened yeah. In real life. Yeah. yeah. There is, look, it, it is a, a dense movie. There is so much there. And, um, uh, no, I, I, I feel like, th- I feel like we've covered the most important stuff. I think what about the is, score? I, I, I mean, it, Ludwig mostly, Orenson just in sicko mode. Yeah, it's, he mostly used his team from Tenet, right? The same mm-hmm. cinematographer, same composer. Yeah, I mean, I mean, Hoyt yeah. Van Hoytem has been shooting everything from it since 2014. Yeah. But, uh, but yeah, uh, uh, Jennifer Lame, same editor, uh, same composer. I think this is just the new team going forward. Uh, yeah. So, um, yeah, uh, you know, but the score is so, awesome. It's uh, it's very different than than the the score for Tenet. A lot of a uh, lot of a lot of use of strings, just being like putting you on edge to be yeah. like make you feel like everything's like about to 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 become destabilized. Um, yeah. It's it's a great technically it's really great work all around. You know, yeah. no one has any argument with that. I so. mean, my my yeah. final thing is just that. Um, look, I, I actually I feel like in when James Cameron was like going really hard for three D the first time around in like two thousand nine, and uh, I remember him saying like, "Look, this should not just be for for big spectacle blockbusters." He's like, "I want like." courtroom dramas and romantic comedies in 3d and i feel like look it is not 3d i think this is better than 3d but i but i feel like you know christopher nolan's use of imax is like he's actually kind of pursuing that he's being like look this doesn't just have to be for you know to to, like like big action movies with like trucks flipping over it's like you can do a drama and that will benefit from do it, shooting it this way. And so if I know not many people do, but if you have the opportunity to 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 look at close ups of Killian Murphy's eyes on like a four story high screen, do it because y- you've never seen anything quite like it before. Indeed. Indeed. Well, at the end of the day, it is, as usual, extremely impressive that Christopher Nolan made a movie. Thank you so much for watching this video of the Filmcast. Check out these other videos that we have available and be sure to hit like, subscribe, and hit that bell icon to get other videos from us in the future. You can also go to thefilmcast.com to catch all of our audio podcast versions of all of our episodes. And support this podcast at patreon.com slash film podcast, where you can sign up for ad-free episodes and exclusive After Darks. Thanks so much to everyone who makes the Filmcast possible.